Hey guys, welcome to part two of what was the video we started yesterday, ranking every episode in Black Mirror. Today, we are finishing up talking about season six, which just aired last week. Um, I have finally gotten through all five new season six episodes uh, with a twice through rewatch and so my opinions have changed since my first watch of all of these episodes and I'm assuming that by the time I re-rank these probably next summer I would like to revisit this that my opinions on these episodes will have shifted just slightly but today I'm going to show you where I am placing all of the season six episodes for Black Mirror on my tier list. This is the tier list we went through yesterday. The pictures are a little different. Um, I actually had to reconstruct it because the old format I was using was not allowing me to add the season six episodes, so that's why it looks slightly different, but all of the episodes we went through yesterday should be in the same spot. But how we're going to do this, um, there should be a link at the start of this video to yesterday's episode if you want to watch that. But I'm going to go through and kind of um, do a slight review of each episode and just talk about then my thoughts on it uh, like we did with the episodes yesterday. So obviously, spoilers ahead if you haven't seen Black Mirror Season 6 or Black Mirror in general. Uh, but let's start... Um, Let's start in backwards order of where I've ranked them. So I think the weakest episode of these five is going to be Maisie Day. Now this is an episode um, set in 2006. They hint at the time period at the beginning of the episode um, when there's a newscast about Tom Cruise's daughter Suri being born. She was born early in 2006. Um, and so you can tell with the costuming, you can tell with the cars, you can tell with the technology. The reason that this is in last place for me is a few different reasons. One, it's very much a paparazzi bad. That's it. Like that is kind of the moral of this story. It it's trying to tell the story of we don't live necessarily nowadays in an era where paparazzi is as bad as it used to be when it when it kind of peaked in the mid 2000s. Obviously, nowadays, everybody has their own smartphones uh, and we have Twitter and Facebook and all those things and, and people are able to basically create their own tabloids and so it's a completely different issue but this episode goes back in time as most of these episodes do take place in the past um and goes back and revisits uh, a problem with with a technological era that we uh encountered and of course then there's this huge plot twist at the end of the episode um that in my opinion is a little detrimental so what happens is we follow this this paparazzo which is the singular form of paparazzi um who basically photographs an actor um, having a gay affair. Of course, this is 2006. The, the times were a bit different, let's say, uh, 17 years ago. And when she sells his photographs of the affair to uh, an employer or a tabloid, uh, he kills himself. And so then she has to deal with the repercussions of kind of falling out with... She, she doesn't like being... Part of the paparazzi anymore and so she becomes disillusioned um moves aside from it but then the opportunity to make a ton of money doing uh paparazzi type things comes up again when there is an actress called Maisie day who disappears um she leaves the set filming in in czechia or back then it was called the czech republic um disappears from the set there after a hit and run where she runs over a wolf and then the next day they find a man in the road exactly where that wolf would have been and you can kind of see the foreshadowing so it's not like a, a major plot twist to what happens but given what we had in the three episodes prior to this this is the fourth episode out of five in this season this is the first time we've really had supernatural elements in black mirror and i think it doesn't work very cohesively because uh, then this group of paparazzi show up at this this wellness retreat in California. Uh, you kind of get shades if you're familiar with the, the movie uh, A Cure for Wellness. It's not quite that extreme, but you kind of get some, um, some of those kind of atmospheric vibes from it. And then as soon as the plot twist happens where you realize that Maisie Day isn't just a, a drugged up actress, that, that she's actually a werewolf, um, things kind of go off the rails. It's handled fairly well, but I think the fact that the plot twist of a Black Mirror episode is that this woman is a werewolf, and there isn't, there's not a technological reason for it. The whole technology aspect of this episode is the paparazzi element that Bo, our main character, um, will stop at nothing really to make the thirty thousand dollars or one million dollars or whatever the the price hiked up to now that Maisie Werewolf is or Maisie Day is revealed to be a werewolf. So. 
like I said, the whole paparazzi bad element it is a little too upfront. It's not very subtle. Um, and like I said, there is foreshadowing to the werewolf reveal, but not enough to really justify its inclusion in the series. Um, and we'll talk about another Supernatural episode because there's two of them out of the five in the in the series. Um, in my opinion, this is the weakest. However, I think season six as a whole is a significant improvement on where they were at in season five. And so this goes above every episode in season five. I'm going to put it right above Men Against Fire in C tier between Metalhead and Men Against Fire. Number four on my ranking for season six is going to be Demon 79. Now, this is the other supernatural um episode of the season. This is more so than even Maisie Day. Um, it's almost treated as though it is a film in universe of Black Mirror. Uh, at the beginning of the of the episode, it, it kind of has this late 70s, early 80s horror aesthetic, and it's um, it's the first of a type of episode called a Red Mirror episode. And so what is going to happen going forward with Black Mirror, they have already greenlit a seventh season now. Um, there are going to be a number of episodes under the Red Mirror label, where Black Mirror sp focuses specifically on technology and human interactions with technology. These Red Mirror episodes are more so going to be supernatural uh, and dealing with human emotions and that sort of thing. And so um, this is even less so a technology episode than Maisie Day. There really isn't any technology uh, in this episode except for the fact that it takes place in 1979, which is why it's called Demon 79. Um, I am going to put it in B tier. We'll talk about it, but I, I want to just place it for now before I forget. Let's place it above National Anthem, but below White Bear. Um, so the plot of this episode, there is a an Indian woman in the north of England, presumably Manchester, because they mention a couple suburbs of Manchester in the episode, um, but she lives in the fictional town of Tipley, uh, which I am fairly certain is, is uh, fictional. I haven't been able to find anything about a town in England called Tipley. But um, she's an Indian woman, obviously born and raised in England, but um, very much feeling the late 70s, early 80s xenophobia um, of England at the time, obviously, with correlations to things like Margaret Thatcher uh, and the National Front and that sort of thing uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, if you're familiar with the history of British politics. So she has all of these emotions that she bottles up because of the the microaggressions that she feels at work she has a co-worker that really treats her poorly especially just for the fact that she is indian um and she kind of suppresses all of these thoughts as i shouldn't say most of us do but she has a lot of thoughts of what would happen if i did this and for her it's it's more so um murders it, it's it's what would happen how would i feel after i just killed this person she has a lot of those premonitions at the beginning of the episode Eventually, she is forced to eat her traditional Indian lunch down in the basement of her workplace where she cuts her hand um, on an old talisman from the 1920s, which is has the white bear symbol on it, or the Bandersnatch symbol. Um, she learns before this that various disappearances have occurred in the store, and, and so the store historically has kind of this haunted element to it. Anyways, she bleeds on this talisman by accident and triggers a demon called Gop, who basically says, in order to save the world, we have to kill three people in the next three days. And so she goes off and, and ends up killing three people, uh, one of which doesn't count because of a, a technicality with, with the the demon system in hell. And, and so she has to kill one more and she's unsuccessful because she's caught by the police. And it's it's a very unique story. The plot isn't super compelling. It's it's something you've probably seen before in horror fiction or horror comedy fiction. Um, but the setting is very, very well done. The 1979 aesthetic, all of the music, the... So I say this as a Doctor Who fan, right? Doctor Who did it first with Rasputin. Um, but the idea to use the song Rasputin in this episode and dress the demon up like the man from Boney M., is an inspired choice. I really like that choice, despite the fact um, that, hold on one sec, let me get the actor's name here, Demon79. Um, the actor who plays Gop is Papa Esiedu, uh, and he looks absolutely nothing like Bobby Farrell. If you, if you compare the two, the guy he's supposed to be dressed as from Boney M, they look absolutely nothing alike, but Boney M is such a 
niche disco band. Um, like everybody knows the song Rasputin, but uh, not everybody knows the band. To be honest with you, I didn't even know that they were Islanders. I always thought that they were like a German band or an Eastern European band. And so I didn't know who they were prior to this episode. Um, but the the fact that they dress gop up like Bobby Farrell is an inspired choice. I think the set design and, and the atmosphere of this episode is fantastic. I don't love the ending, but it makes sense with the story. Um, and that's like, for me, it's fourth out of five. I'm still putting it in B tier. It was an enjoyable watch. I liked it more second rewatch. Um, and I think this is one of the episodes that will grow on me more. So like I said, if we revisit this ranking next summer, I'm curious to see where my opinions on all of these episodes will go. And I think my thoughts on Demon 79 will move up just that much more. We move on to number three out of five. And here's my hot take. It For me right now, it's going to be Beyond the Sea for a couple different reasons. I'm going to put Beyond the Sea right above White Bear, but below Hated in the Nation. Now, this is the episode that everybody is screaming about right now. Everybody loves this episode. It's got Aaron Paul in it. It's got, um, oh gosh, don't make me look up her name. Um, who is the girl from, uh, oh gosh, I'm going to have to look it up. Um, Kate Mara, duh, from uh, Fantastic Four and from uh, House of Cards. Kate Mara is the wife. Basically, this story, um, before, before I go into why I don't love this episode that much compared to Everybody saying it's it's the best episode of Black Mirror in a long time. It, the ending is is fantastic. It's the darkest um, that that Black Mirror has been in years. Black Mirror is back because of Beyond the Sea. Um, the backstory to this episode is it takes place in 1969. Very obviously an alternative 1969 to our own. Um, but during the space race, there are these two astronauts who go off into space, um, and in order to not go crazy in space because it's a six-year mission. They're awake for the entire six years. In order to not go crazy up there, technology has allowed them to basically create replicas of themselves through which they're able to transfer their consciousness. So think of something like Avatar, the, the Blue People Avatar movies. Um, very similar concept. They have these bodies, um, which instead of being blue, are, are exact replicas of their human form that are back on Earth. And so the astronauts, when they sleep, are able to transfer their consciousness into their replicas. It's the 60s. There's a lot of religious fervor and a lot of cults going on. And one of these cults breaks into the house of one of these astronauts and ends up burning his replica uh, and killing his very real family. So this man is able to have a family back on Earth while he's in space, um, and these people aren't a big fan of that, aren't a big fan of fake people walking the Earth. And so as a repercussion, they kill his replica, destroy the, the mechanical body, and kill his actual family. And so he's dealing with significant grief up in space. I thought up to that point, the episode was very good. And then for me it starts to become really, really predictable. So the other astronaut on the ship starts to obviously feel very bad for his partner. They can't build him a new replica system um, because the replicas were created back on Earth. And now obviously they are not light years away, but very, very far away in space. So he and his wife, th this other astronaut, played by Aaron Paul, come up with a plan to allow, I think it's David, um, the other astronaut, to have a little time on Earth again. And in order to do that, they transfer Cliff's, or excuse me, they uh, they transfer David's consciousness into Cliff's replica. Cliff is the Aaron Paul astronaut. So they transfer his consciousness into the other body, and he basically walks around living as Cliff um, just for a little bit while he is able to kind of capture his emotions back on Earth and, and properly grieve back on Earth despite his family no longer being there. I thought this was very powerful. Um, I thought this was a, a very good start to the episode. And then you start to see some very, very predictable undertones. And of course, what happens when a guy masquerades as another man? If you guessed that he tries to sleep with the man's wife, you are correct. Um, and so my wife wasn't watching this with me, but as soon as this episode started and you could kind of feel those undertones, I, I paused it and I turned to my wife and I said, here's the plot of the episode. What do you think happens next? And she goes, is he falling for the guy's wife? And I went, he's falling for the guy's wife. Um, and my problem isn't necessarily with that character beat. It's been done a billion times, but um, 
some of the character beats in these other episodes have been done a billion times too. And the reason that I didn't like it so much in Beyond the Sea is A, it feels super predictable. And B, the episode treats it like it isn't. The episode treats it like there's going to be a twist that that changes it from, from what we actually expect. And that doesn't happen, um, at least not in my opinion. And then by the end of the episode, um, he, of course, makes a move on Cliff's wife using Cliff's body, and she rejects him. And what do you think happens next? Um, this is where a lot of people really like the episode. They didn't see this twist ending coming. I did, and I, I like I. I'm not going to pretend like I am smarter than than everybody. And I saw this twist coming. That makes me better than you. It just like. I saw this twist coming from a mile away. As soon as his family died, and as soon as they, um, they kind of brought this concept of him using Cliff's body that thought was in my head and as soon as he gets rejected by cliff's wife it was like he's gonna kill he's gonna kill cliff's family and so the episode treats it like this major twist and it isn't a major twist it's just a powerful um i shouldn't say subversion let me say this i i mentioned that demon 79 is probably going to be an episode that i think of a lot higher the next time i watch it I almost wonder if the same thing isn't going to be true for Beyond the Sea. Um, I was amazed by the first two episodes of the season, and Beyond the Sea came, and it was the episode I was most looking forward to, and it's the episode I was most disappointed by. Um, and I think it's the way that the episode treats the plot points, as if they are unexpected. And a lot of people feel that they were unexpected. A lot of people were like, this is the darkest ending to an episode ever. He kills the man's family. We never saw this coming. You can see it coming as soon as his own family dies. Um, but that being said, I, I think the performances in this episode are very good. I'm not a huge Aaron Paul fan. I didn't think he was the best part of Breaking Bad. Um, I don't mind Kate Mara. I think she... I think her acting is inconsistent, for, for lack of a better phrase. And then the other guy, um, the actor who plays David, his name is Josh Harnett. You might know him from Pearl Harbor. He hasn't really been in a ton of stuff that I've seen in the last 20 years, um, but that was his big uh, claim to fame was the, the Michael Bay film Pearl Harbor. Um, I thought the performances were very good. I thought the atmosphere of the episode was very good. The directing is great. The set design is arguably better than Demon 79. But for me... The reason this episode isn't any higher is because I felt like the plot was too predictable and the episode was treating me as though I was dumber than I am um, by by treating these things like twists. They weren't twists. They were they were one of three things that could have happened, right? Um, this man walks the earth in another man's body. He either falls for his wife, he doesn't fall for his wife, or a third option that I don't see because it's got romantic undertones. The, the whole title of Beyond the Sea is from the, the jazz song. Uh, Somewhere beyond the sea. That was really bad. Somewhere beyond the sea. Never mind. Ignore me. I, I should never pretend to sing uh, on a stream again. I like that they use the French version of the song um, rather than the, the English version that most of us know and, and where the episode gets its title from. But um, anyways, that's where I'm putting Beyond the Sea in B tier. Uh, then we move up. This might be, I don't know if people are going to think this is more controversial of a placement than Beyond the Sea is, but uh, number two is going to be Joan is Awful. I really liked this episode. I'm going to put it below White Christmas and above Hated in the Nation. Joan is Awful is a fantastic opener to the season. It gets us kind of back on track to uh, where Black Mirror used to be. This is probably the most Black Mirror episode of any episodes this season. So it tells the story of this woman, Joan, played by Annie Murphy, who is very disliked at her work. She, she has a very strong personality, very dislikable character beats. Um, Hence the title, Joan is Awful. And basically what happens is she has this very eventful day um, where a lot happens and she makes some questionable decisions with her evening. And 
during this day, she goes to her therapist and they drop this, this concept of she feels like she's not the main character in her own life. And the therapist asks if she wants to be. Now, this isn't what triggers what happens next. It, it's actually a very fun uh, reason as to what happens next. But essentially, she goes home that night and discovers that there is a Netflix show, or it's called... So it's confusing, right? Um, and we'll talk about it more in Loch Henry, if I remember. Um, but so instead of Netflix, it's called Streamberry, which is essentially their, their version of Netflix. And Joan discovers that there is a show on Streamberry called Joan is Awful. And they start watching it, and it's Selma Hayek who plays this character, Joan. And as she and her boyfriend continue to watch this episode, it becomes very apparent that the entire episode is based on Joan's life, and Joan's day specifically, uh, in a very dramatized, grand Netflix drama fashion. Um, Eventually, it's revealed that that she has thoughts of cheating on her boyfriend and, and kind of already has moved in that direction. Uh, so he leaves. She loses her job because of things that are mentioned in the episode about her job that are top secret. Um, and over time, Joan basically goes crazy about the fact that Streamberry, or Netflix, is stealing her life um, in order to create content. And so she goes to her lawyer, and the lawyer says, and this is the, in my opinion, the best part of the episode, the lawyer says, they can completely do this because you signed the terms and conditions. Now, this has been used in shows before. Uh, South Park notably used a terms and conditions clause in their episode. Um, I think it was the Facebook one. But basically, in the fine print of Netflix or Streamberry's uh terms and conditions, you give them the right to monitor your life and give them access to content. And as the episode goes on, um, <laughs> it's got this kind of funny concept where in the Selma Hayek show, Joan is Awful, then there is another version of Joan is Awful in that show where instead of Selma Hayek playing Joan, that Joan is played by Kate Blanchett. And it goes on and goes on. And eventually, Joan gets the attention of Selma Hayek by... Um, defecating in a church uh, to get Selma Hayek's attention and, and try to get her on her side of threatening Netflix or threatening Streamberry. So Selma Hayek and, and Joan, played by Annie Murphy, go to the Streamberry headquarters and find out that all of this is being fed by a quantum computer. Now, quantum physics is a concept that is really popular in fiction right now. Very obviously, the new Ant-Man film deals a lot with quantum physics and quantum realities. Uh, Marvel has been using that a lot lately with the Loki films and with the Spider-Man films. Um, but they discover that this quantum computer um, is feeding infinite realities about other people's lives and creating shows out of them. And then comes one of the cooler plot points of the episode. And, and it, I'm not saying that it was a plot twist because you can kind of see it coming, especially when they introduce the second Joan is Awful show with Kate Blanchett. But they break into the computer room and the security guard is played by Michael Sarah. And instead of just ignoring the fact that it's Michael Sarah, they mention that this security guard is played by Michael Sarah. And it becomes, they discover that that this computer, um, when it's feeding realities, has fed the current reality that they're on. And that Annie Murphy, as Joan, is not the original Joan. And so then um, it kind of cuts to the real Joan, which is, which is a, a completely different step of reality. And she destroys uh, the quantum computer. And the Selma Hayek character, who was with Joan in the Annie Murphy reality, is now played by Annie Murphy. And so it's, it's super meta. It's very fun. Um, Black Mirror has never really done comedy before. Um, you can see it with with certain episodes like Nosedive has underlying humor. It was written by Rashida Jones. Um, I would say the most like comedy episode that we've seen so far is probably Rachel Jack and Ashley 2. Uh, and I, I didn't mention this in yesterday's episode and I probably should have, but one thing I don't like about Rachel Jack and Ashley 2 is it tries really hard to be funny and it treats itself like it's very funny. And most of the humor is just swearing. Now, I, I'm one of those people. I, I, I'm not against swearing by any means in comedy. I think it, it adds a certain level to comedy. But when the entire joke is dropping an F-bomb, like that's not 
funny. You're not really trying for anything. And and Joan is Awful has a couple of those moments, but all in all, I think this is very easily the funniest episode of Black Mirror. Um, and like I said, it, it still feels the most Black Mirror-ish of any of the season six episodes. Um, but I really liked Joan is Awful. I get the opinion that the more that I watch this episode, I will like it less. And so this is the episode I expect to drop further in my rankings. Um, but for me right now, it's sitting firmly second out of five um, of season six Black Mirror episodes right there in the middle of B tier. Last but not least, episode number one out of five, the best episode in my opinion in season six, uh, and that is going to be Loch Henry. Now, I am going to put Loch Henry... I'll put it right below Hang the DJ. I think I do think it's better, um, at least upon my first two watches, I think it's better than Shut Up and Dance. Um, but I think it is still not quite to the levels of Hang the DJ. And I, I put San Junipero in A tier, not S tier. So uh, no reason I could justify putting La Henry higher than A tier. But um, one thing I want to touch on before we get into the episode is this episode is about a documentary team. And in the episode, they pitch the idea of this documentary to Netflix. And at the same time, Streamberry exists in the episode. They watch Streamberry together. And so I'm a little confused. I'm more so confused because I've just finished this timeline video, right? That I'm going through the entire timeline of Black Mirror. In Joan is Awful, it's very obvious that Streamberry is Netflix. It's, it's even got the opening title sound of Netflix. So why then in Loch Henry are Streamberry and Netflix two different companies? I have no idea, but that's beyond the point. It's not a big deal. It's just something I caught, um, a little Easter egg that I thought was really kind of weird and confusing. But Loch Henry is the story of two filmmakers. They are dating each other. One of, one of them is from Scotland. One of them is from the United States. Um, and they go to Loch Henry, which is this fictional small Scottish town um, where the main character, whose name is... Bear with me. I, like I said, I've only seen these episodes twice, and I have watched the entire season in the last five days. So, um, Davis is the main character. And so they go to Davis's hometown uh, in order to basically make a nature documentary about small town Scotland. And Pia, the, his girlfriend, um, kind of falls in love with the area, thinks it's very cool. Um, his father is dead. He died in a police shootout, or he, he died as a result of medical bacteria poisoning because of a police shootout. Um, and they meet up with a an old friend of Davis's named Stuart. And first of all, I want to pause and say the best part of this episode is Daniel Portman. Um, if you're familiar with Game of Thrones, he played Pod or Podrick Payne in Game of Thrones. I didn't realize he had the acting chops that this episode shows. Um, Obviously, he could sing if you've seen Game of Thrones, and he, he was doable in Game of Thrones. Um, but when he shows up in Loch Henry, I went, that's Pod from Game of Thrones. And he's fantastic in this episode. Um, his accent is unreal. I get that he is actually Scottish, but he's from Glasgow. It's a different accent than small town Scotland. And I think he plays the character perfectly. He is very funny. Um, he... This isn't a funny episode, but he is the, the comic relief character, but he still has a lot of powerful moments in the episode. Uh, and one of these moments is when he and Davis are telling Pia the story of how his father got shot. Basically, there was a, uh, a man from the town 20 or so years ago. You're presuming this episode takes place either in the present or in, within the last five years. Um, and so this happened in the late 90s that there was a serial killer in the town uh, who basically kidnapped and tortured tourists. And they, they found um, his torture chamber. And, and when they went to confront him, it was Davis's father who went to confront the murderer. Um, basically, uh, he killed the tourists, he killed his parents, and then he shot Davis's father. And like I said, Davis's father uh, eventually died um, due to a medical bacteria poisoning. So, as soon as Pia, the girl, hears this, they decide to change the, the focus of their documentary. Instead of focusing it on nature and, and the local people, they really want to focus it on this murder, this series of murders that has never really gone out to the public because it took place right before uh, Princess Diana died. And so the, the news shifted their attention very much away from it. Um, and so they, they go through with... Uh, 
talking or going through making this documentary, interviewing people, interviewing Davis's mom, um, which is the the subtle build up to as soon as I say subtle build up, you, you can kind of expect where this is going. Um, I wouldn't say it's unpredictable by any means, but it's handled very, very well in comparison to something like Beyond the Sea that I had issues with them treating it like a plot twist. Um, this still is treated like a plot twist, but it doesn't hit you over the head with it. Um, it's one of those, it, it's more so, uh, is it dramatic irony where we know more than the characters? I, I, I should have paid more attention in high school English, but um, we learn the truth about what's going on before the characters do. And so that's where a lot of the tension in the episode comes from. This is this is the most tension there has been in a an episode, I want to say since Crocodile. This episode feels very much like Crocodile in the way that it's shot. Um, it's It takes place in Scotland, so it's kind of got that Scandinavian noir aesthetic to it. Um, it's almost like a, a darker version. If you've ever seen the film The Queen uh, with uh, Helen Mirren as Queen Elizabeth, it came out in like 2006. Um, it's got very similar cinematography to that film, just a little bit darker in its color scheme. But anyway, the plot twist is that when they uncover the, the torture den um, of this serial killer, they separately discover that Davis's parents were both involved in the murders. Um, they were part of the, it was a torture team. It wasn't just a single, um, a single job of this, this serial killer. And so um, upon discovering this, Pia is at Davis's house with Davis's mom and obviously runs away to try to get help after she learns of the truth. And, and Davis's mom learns that Pia found out the truth and basically gives up all of... She filmed all of the murders on um, the backsides of crime. What's the show? It's basically like like Scottish Law and Order. It's called Bergerac. Um, she basically filmed over copies of Bergerac with the torture um, and, and all of these killings. And so Pia discovers this, and upon Pia running out and being chased by Davis's mother, who ends up chasing her into a field. She trips, hits her head on a rock, and drowns and dies. So Pia's dead. Um, Davis's mother ends up killing herself because she realizes she's not going to get away with it anymore. And at the end of the episode, Davis finishes the documentary and sells the rights. Um, I can't remember who the... Um, Kate Cesar, I think she's with Netflix, but I can't remember. Um, and they end up winning a BAFTA for it. And so it's the end of this episode is really powerful. It's got this concept of when does tragedy become content? And it's it's not a, an original idea to Black Mirror. It's something that's gone um, over aggressively in the last five years with the with the the rise of crime documentaries and that sort of thing. And just this concept of when does people's grieving and, and, and when is an appropriate time to start making documentaries about very real crimes and how it's affected families and people. Um, I really liked this episode. I thought it was really powerful. I thought it looked really good. Um, I thought the acting was great. Like I said, the, the plot twist um, is handled very, very well compared to some of the other episodes in this season. Uh, and for me, it sits firmly at the top of season six's episodes. Before we go through and, and just go a final ranking of all of the episodes, I did want to say, so since the end of season four, more, more specifically after Bandersnatch was season five, there has been this feeling that Black Mirror is dead and that, that Black Mirror is, a, is becoming a different show than what it used to be. That's something that every show goes through. Um, I will say, I really liked season six. It, I think it, as a whole, is probably stronger than seasons, obviously season five, but I genuinely, I think it's stronger than season two. Um, season two has one very good episode uh, and two, n one mid episode and one not so great episode. Um, I think it's better than season five, and I think it's better than season two. I don't think Black Mirror is where it was with seasons three and four. I think the shift of the sh uh, the show has shifted its focus away from technology now, especially with this this Red Mirror concept now. Um, it is a different show, and I personally don't love that. I liked the original Black Mirror, but I get that 
in order to make more ideas, more original stuff, especially in something like an anthology series, you have to move in different directions. Um, and so Black Mirror is moving in a new direction, and that's that's okay. Um, like I said, it's not it's not what I like, but I think this is still good TV. It's not the Black Mirror that I fell in love with, but it's still watchable. It's still very good. It's just different. Um, and so those are my opinions on season six. Let me know what you thought of season six in the comments section below. But one last time, we will go through every episode uh, with our rankings. So in last place, all of Black Mirror, all 28 installments, including the, two, uh, the, the Christmas special and the movie, um, Number 28, we have Rachel, Jack, and Ashley 2. 27, the Waldo moment. 26, Archangel. 25, Smithereens. 24, Bandersnatch. 23, at the top of D tier, we have Striking Vipers. Uh, we move up to C tier. Number 22, Men Against Fire. 21, Maisie Day. 20, Metalhead. 19, top of C tier is Black Museum. Uh, bottom of B tier, number 18, the National Anthem. 17, Demon 79. 16, White Bear. 15, Beyond the Sea. 14, uh, Hated in the Nation. 13, Joan is Awful. 12, I have uh, White Christmas, and 11, top of B tier is Playtest. Then we move up to A tier. Number 10, I have Crocodile. Uh, number 9, 15 Million Merits. Number 8, uh, Shut Up and Dance is the title of that episode there. Number 7, Loch Henry. Number 6, Hang the DJ. Number 5, top of A tier is San Junipero. And then we move up to S tier, the four Perfect episodes, in my opinion, in Black Mirror. Number four is Nosedive. Number three, USS Callister. Number two, The Entire History of You. And number one, in my opinion, the greatest episode of Black Mirror is Be Right Back. So let me know what you thought of my rankings in the comment section below. Like I said, these are not perfect. These are just my rankings. Um, I am going to revisit this sometime in the future, hopefully next summer, uh, where I have a little bit of breathing time, where I get to watch all of these episodes again. And I'm sure that my opinions will change as time goes on. Like I said, I expect Beyond the Sea and Demon 79 to go up. I expect Joan is Awful to go down as time goes on. But that is where I have them now. If you're curious why I have some of the older episodes ranked where they are, go check out yesterday's episode. There should be a link to it uh, at the beginning of this episode video specifically, um, and I will put a link to this video in yesterday's video as well. But that is all for part two of all of our Black Mirror rankings. Sometime this weekend or next, you will see the entire timeline of Black Mirror appear on this channel, so go check that out. Uh, like, share, subscribe, check out all of our Black Mirror content, plenty of non-Black Mirror, uh, non Mirror content on the channel as well. But until then, see you very, very soon.